Hey folks, welcome to The Other People Show. I'm Brad Listy in Los Angeles. It's nice to be with you. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you're doing okay. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the program on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. It is Friday, so it's time for another flashback episode. Today I'm going to be sharing an outtake from episode 117, my conversation with Susan Strait. It first aired on October 28th, 2012. So more than a decade ago, if you can believe it. Susan Strait's most recent novel is called Mecca, published to great acclaim in 2022 by FSG. It was a finalist for the Kirkus Prize. It was an NPR Best Book of the Year, a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice, you name it. Susan Strait's other books include the national bestseller High Wire Moon, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and A Million Nightingales, which was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize. She also wrote a memoir called In the Country of Women, and she is a distinguished professor of creative writing at the University of California, Riverside. An outtake from my conversation with Susan Strait back in 2012 is coming up in just a bit. So a quick reminder and a bit of an update before we get going. I want to let you know about my newsletter. If you're not already aware, I do a weekly email newsletter. And here's the latest. It is now on Substack. So you can read it in your inbox, same as always. But you can also read the newsletter online. You can subscribe to my Substack. The newsletter will live there and other stuff eventually is going to live there too. So check out my Substack. Do you know how to do that? Just go to Substack and search for my name. As well, there is an Other People Patreon community that I want you to be aware of. If you like this show, if you listen regularly, if you get something from it, I hope you will consider joining the Other People Patreon community to help sustain this work that I do to keep the show going into the future. So go over to patreon.com slash other PPL pod and give it a look. You can get merchandise. You can get a book club subscription over at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. Today's episode is brought to you by Abrams Books, publisher of Idlewild, the darkly funny and very brilliant, if I may say so, debut novel by James Frankie Thomas. Idlewild is set at a Quaker high school in lower Manhattan. This is a campus novel. It's a book about a complicated set of relationships, and it takes a very fresh angle on queer and trans identity. Idlewild is the official September pick of the Other People Book Club, and it's just great. It nails the heartbreak of adolescence and growing up and being a theater kid. That's Idlewild by James Frankie Thomas, available now everywhere books are sold from Abrams Books. Okay, so it is time for today's flashback. An outtake from episode 117, my conversation with Susan Strait. It first aired on October 28th, 2012. A reminder that the full episode is available in the feed. So if you like this outtake, if you like what you hear and you want to go in for the full conversation, just look for episode 117 in the feed. It is there. All episodes of this show are available to listeners. Okay. I think that covers it. Let's get to the flashback. Here I am in conversation with Susan Strait. Everyone was born there. Um, my ex-husband was born there. Everyone in our neighborhood was born there pretty much. And So people don't leave generally that much? Well, across the street from me is someone who just told me her, her mom had just died. She's lived across from me for 18 years. Her dad was a boxer in Oakland. Her mom and dad met in Oakland, and they got married, and two days later he shipped out for the Korean War. She's Irish-American. But her ex-husband was born in San Bernardino, you know, and so people don't go very far. It's funny, um, on Friday I'm going to the football game from my high school, John W. North High School, and I'll probably see two, 300 people that I've known, you know, from my whole life. And we're watching people's grandkids play. Our cousin's grandkids are all now playing football. 
So my daughter was homecoming princess for the other high school on Saturday, and she got to see her cousins. And she hadn't seen my ex-husband's cousin, Jody, who's 55. Her grandkids are playing football. Jody came to the game, and when she saw my youngest daughter, she started crying. And she said, oh, she looks so beautiful. She just looks just like my mama, who died when she was only 51. So, I mean, that's how it is to live where we live. That's nice. It is really nice. And Rosette went and hugged all her cousins, and I think she had tears in her eyes, too, because it was such a thrill for them to see a black homecoming princess, first of all, but to see how she's 17 and suddenly she looks like Jody's mom when she was 17. So, wait, your daughter's black. Uh, so my ex-husband looks like Shaquille O'Neal, but a little shorter. Oh, really? Yeah. He's how, how tall is he? He's six four, and he weighs three ten. Oh wow, that's a big guy. He's yeah, he's a former correctional officer too. Okay, that doesn't help with the whole intimidation factor. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, but that your daughter is the homecoming princess. Her boyfriends must be terrified. There are no boyfriends. Oh, there are no boyfriends. <laughs> no. The middle. What about the had... what about the homecoming prince? What what about him? Yeah, she just found one. She just found one. Okay. <laughs> The oldest daughter is 23, my middle daughter is 21, and the youngest one is 17. The middle daughter has had some boyfriends, and they definitely had to go through the gauntlet. Uh, the first boyfriend, I think, was in the ninth grade, and unfortunately she decided to introduce him to the family during Memorial Day uh, barbecue, which meant like 400 Simses, and he came in the afternoon when everybody had had a lot of beer. <laughs> so there were... There was the dad, you know, my ex-husband, his three brothers, and four cousins, and nobody weighs under under 300 pounds. Wow. So they were all standing in a row. And they, were, and they were a little boozy. <laughs> they were a little angry that he was even there. It was a long day for him. Yeah. I actually respected him a lot for, for surviving that. Yeah, he was a ninth grader? Is he that was right? a ninth grader. That takes He's some... a big football player now, so it was okay. But okay. he wasn't quite so big back then, and I just remember watching him. And then they said, well, you know who you really have to be scared of? It's not It's not us. And then they all pointed at me, <laughs> which was true. Really? Do you have like that side of you? Like, are you very protective? And Yeah. Yeah. See? It's unassuming, but there's some toughness there. And like, I don't, I don't want to say Mama Grizzly just because I don't want to somehow invoke Sarah Palin, but you know what I'm saying. Like, Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> You know what I mean. Like uh, She paints her fingernails. Who does? Sarah Palin. Does she? She does the beauty thing. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. I don't like her very much. I gotta there be are a lot of uncles, but if I call them, what they like to say is, you can't uncall me once you call me. So, yeah, the girls, the girls are well protected. Oh, They're okay. very pretty. And you have three. Mm-hmm. What was it like to raise three kids? It's a lot of kids. It's a lot of kids. I have 80 nieces and nephews. I have 20 great nieces and nephews, and I have two great great nieces. Holy cow! So I'm, wait, but where do they I'm all come 52. from? I'm <laughs> 52. Where, yeah, where do they all come from? Like, how does this? How does the math work? Like, it's a lot of people in the family. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but your ex husband's side of the family has he has three brothers? You said. Uh, he, there are six in his side. Okay. Um, there were there. Are, I had a half brother. I have step brothers and sisters, foster brothers and sisters, and then I have one full brother who died uh, 11 years ago. And so he had a daughter. So I have a, a great niece um, from him. I have other nieces and nephews we have from both sides. Okay. But also, you know, I was telling you about Mrs. Albert. So Mrs. Albert's daughter, Rivia, married my ex-husband's cousin, Eddie. So their kids are all, call me auntie as well. Oh my goodness. It's a pretty big collection. Yeah. So, I mean, when you, when you drive around town, because like, this is what seems so different, even though Riverside is not that far as the crow flies from Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles feels like a place where everybody's from someplace else. Everything is transient. It's, it seems that way, though there are, of course, are exceptions to the rule, and there are people who have lived there their whole lives, and there are generations you know, you know that does exist here. But just it's not as concentrated, obviously, and um, it doesn't seem like, uh, from a ratio perspective, there are quite as many. But it sounds like in Riverside, you know, when you drive around town or you walk around town, you're seeing people that you grew up with. You're seeing... Everywhere you go, you know everybody. Is that the way that I, it is? I think Riverside's representative of a really interesting kind of place in California, but really all over the nation, too. If When I went to Plaquemine, I mean, there were people there that I met three generations back. And when I went to Plaquemine Parish, for example, I met people who'd been there since, you know, 1880. Yeah. I think Riverside, Fresno, Bakersfield, Stockton. I love going to Oxnard. I love going out to... Um, if, when you think about it, going out to 
the, all the different towns, even if you go to certain parts of Orange County, like Santa Ana, you have people who've been there for five generations. So I think Riverside is representative of that kind of city. It's 300,000 people, but yeah, it's like it's a collection of small villages. I think I've traveled all over the state in the last five years. I was just writing an essay about Ross McDonald uh, because I re- I've... And is he rude? I mean, I know he lived here and wrote about he Los wrote Angeles, about, but he wrote about he, California. Is really. he originally from here? He was born in San Francisco. Oh, he was okay, and so he has names for his different versions of Santa Barbara, mm-hmm. L.A. and San Francisco don't have stand-ins, but the other towns do, and that that actually was part of the reason that I created Rio Seco. I didn't want my Riverside to be bound by actual geography or place. And I wanted it to be like his version of Santa Teresa, which is his Santa Barbara. Okay. So, yeah. So, so just for people listening, Rio Seco in your work is a stand-in for Riverside. It is. And I, I realized uh, when I was driving around, like I said, these past five years, that I have Tourmaline, which was a sort of a stand-in for a tiny little town near Cabazon out in the desert. But then Mecca was real. The Salton Sea was real. And then I have Rio Seco. But Colton is real. San Bernardino is real. The other, the places that are around the places. And that's really the way Ross McDonald does it. That's the way Faulkner does it, too. I didn't read Faulkner until after I had begun writing about Rio Seco, the fictional Rio Seco. But when I learned about Faulkner and I looked at the, the geography of what he was doing, it was that way, as was Flannery O'Connor. Um, Louise Erdrich uh, comes to mind, too, because there are lots of little towns in her work. And some are fictional and some are, are non, not, not made up. But yeah, I, I, I was driving around California and I was thinking of towns like Lindsay, you know, which is where the olives come from. Or if you go to old Paso Robles, now it's wine country. But I met people who'd been in Paso Robles, you know, since 1910. So I like that part of California. I love the fact, and even though my kids hate it, you know, every time we go to the grocery store, we're going to see somebody that I've known since I was five. So they just don't want to come to the store anymore. <laughs> I was going to say, you get stuck. I mean, they that's get honest. stuck for an hour and they'll be like, I have homework. So now that they drive, you know, now that everybody drives, they go to the store because they don't want me to go to the store because I'll be gone for two hours. Right. Well, and I'll that's... come back and say, oh my goodness, I ran into cousin Terry <laughs> and she told me this and she told me that. But that's that's why I'm so lucky. That's where all these stories come from. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I was going to say like, because I, I go back and forth and I, I can't help but idealize living in a community where you know a lot of people, where there's a feeling of real community and a feeling of, of uh, close-knittedness, as opposed to in Los Angeles, where I have uh, a lot of good friends, but I feel like it's difficult to socialize just to get across town and to organize and to make a plan. And I, I don't see people. You know, it's very easily, very easy to become isolated in a big city, strangely it's ab- enough. absolutely true, though. And it's fascinating to me because I've been on the road for this new book. When I'm in a place like San Francisco, or last week I was in Eugene, and when I'm in Los Angeles, I am utterly and completely alone. And I am never alone at home. So for me, it's it's the opposite. I, I walk for four or five hours. I write essays. I write in my notebook. At home, people come over from 7.30 in the morning until midnight. It, I'm The house is always full of people. So when do you get work done? So I get in my car, and I, I drive to an orange grove, or I drive to a park, or sometimes I just seriously just pull over on a street like a dirt road and I sit there for an hour and I write in the notebook and then after everybody's done coming over and I lock the door around midnight then I type it into the computer and if I'm alone for a long stretch of time which doesn't happen very often um, then I can start thinking about the shape of a story but I will always refer back to the handwritten notes I'll have maybe 20 pages handwritten already of whatever story it is and then I'll start putting it together on the huge ancient desktop we also only have one computer, so I mean, everybody's in there watching like bad lip reading and funny or die. So after they're done showing me all the new stuff, like Black Siri, which is really funny, then when everyone's finally done, and, and we only have one TV and we have one computer, so when everybody's finished, um, it's usually really late at night. I have a cup of tea, and then I'll write between midnight and maybe 2, 3 in the morning. Oh but I can only do that for a couple of nights a week now. Okay, so you do. Otherwise, I'll be too tired. I was going to say so, but it, you know, it's it's inspiring and it's a little humbling because you've got all this stuff going on. You've got three kids. You've got teaching. You've got a busy life, and you're still managing to crank out books. You've written several books, uh, and are you saying that you wrote most, if not all, most if not all of this novel and other novels sitting in your car? The last three novels I wrote mostly in my car. 
I, this is my eighth book, Between Heaven and Here. And uh, this trilogy, which I started writing in, I really started writing it in about 2001. Um, I, I wrote probably 80% of each of those in on legal pads, on little tiny notebooks. I have I have a part of A Million Nightingales, which the part that takes place during slavery in Plaquemine Parish in starts in 1811. I have a note that I found written on the back of a Disneyland day pass while I was waiting for two hours for my kids to be in line with a ride and my mom didn't want to go on the ride. So she sat on the bench next to me and she just stared at the entrance of the ride waiting for them to come out because she was worried about them. And during that like two hours of conversation when she would take a break, I was writing on this Disneyland day pass. <laughs> so I have little pieces of this mother who was a slave worrying about her her daughter because she was out of her sight and it translated in the strangest way um, so i was sort of thinking about the ferocity of all these moms that i'd written about i have things written a lot of things written on the magazine insert cards you know i would be somewhere and at the doctor's office and it'd be three hour wait somebody would break a toe or whatever you could you can really get a fit a lot on those little magazine insert cards that fall out of like Runner's World. Right. Have, like, <laughs> Why do they always have the should... shittiest magazines at doctor's offices? I don't Just know. give me something good. I'll read anything though, and if the if the insert card falls out, then I have about fifty of those for the middle book. Take one candlelight a room. Uh, I had a kid who tore her ACL playing basketball, so there were a lot of doctor's office visits. So you're just this is the thing though, is that there's a tenacity to you and also just a there's just no excuses when when you have time you use it you write uh, yeah, I don't know I, I I think I speak from my own experience and I think there are a lot of people out there who need conditions to be right do you know what I'm saying like writers can get neurotic and finicky about that and it's got to be just the right time but you're just like sitting at Disneyland scribbling on the back of a ticket or you're pulling over to the side of the road and scribbling into a notepad for 45 minutes and you're getting books done this way so there it, a, you're just using whatever time you have and you're making the most of it, but B, you have to be consistent with it too. I mean, you are finding time most days to at least get some words down. I mean, it's, it's just, that's what I like to do. If if I can't write or I can't read, yeah, I feel really sad. My oldest kid has to read every day um, as well. She She's in Austin, Texas. She's working for AmeriCorps. She's completely broke. She just called me an hour, an hour ago. Um, she just voted in Texas for the first time. She calls me every day, and we're the most alike when it comes to that. We have to read every day, and we can't be around people constantly. So everybody can see in our faces when we've had enough. And she and I will just go sit in you know, separate corners of the room, and we have to be reading all the time. And that's how I've been since I was little. So, I mean, I like writing in the same way. It's an obsession for, for me, for sure. Is it ever hard for you? No. I mean, I never get enough time to do it. If I have time, like once all those kids are gone and if I were ever quiet, I try to imagine myself at a writer's calling. I think it would be disastrous. <laughs> because <laughs> Just too much right. time. It would be, what would I do then? And I'm also, I, I'm really worried. I'm not good at being alone. I like complaining about everybody coming to the house so that when I have that hour, I want to write so badly. But what you just said is true. What if I'm the opposite? Um, what if that, what if next year when the last kid finally goes off, and also my nephew doesn't live with me anymore now. What if you know, what if I can't stand being alone? What if I stop writing? I don't think it'll happen, but you never know. Yeah, but you've got that whole that's the thing. You have that whole community around you. Do you know what I'm saying? Like obviously it won't be exactly the same because the house won't be as you know, as busy as it once was. Somebody will be at the house. Somebody will be that. you'll you'll see people. All you have to do is go to the drugstore. Well, all I have to do is be in the front yard. Right. But um <laughs> I just wrote an essay for the New York Times about my neighbor, my other next door neighbor. Uh, who's a, just been a surrogate mom for the third time. She has five kids and three grandkids, and she's delivered three babies for couples. And uh, it was after the, the debate where uh, single motherhood was being called into question, and I realized that, that one of Mitt Romney's sons had had uh, all of his kids do surrogacy. So anyway, I wrote about her. She comes over every day. I can't, you're right, it won't be quiet. Um, we like to hang out. That's something else, though, is it to be a surrogate? It's really, it's really crazy. This last time, she was carrying triplets. Oh my! She was God. carrying three girls, and two of them How did, but, I mean, were not it... viable, and they were absorbed back into the womb, which is what happens. And so she's carrying one girl, but she got really, really uncomfortable and really big. So I was writing about 
we were all trying to take care of her on the block. I was pruning her roses and pruning her flowers so she wouldn't have to bend over. And we were taking her food. And then it's just so strange that, you know, she goes and delivers a baby and she comes home and she's never held the baby or really, she looks at the baby, but all the, all of her kids, she has, you know, she has like three grandkids at the house too. And then she has, um, her youngest three. So what does she, she does it for income? Does she do, I mean, yeah. and she does it to help people, obviously. I mean, she does it for the money. She does it for the money. Well, she, she, it, it's. Is it emotionally? I mean, I know physically it's difficult, and obviously all not the, emotionally difficult at all. She told me, but physically it's really hard. Okay. See, she, I, 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 think I it's imagine really fascinating that she rents out her body. So I wrote about that. Yeah, that's super fascinating. Yeah, I thought it was really crazy because it's such a growing industry too, and people don't pay attention. They're like, "Oh, surrogate mom," making fun of what it is. I watched her, you know, be an incredible pain. This was during the summertime. Her air conditioner broke. Her dryer is broken right now, so she's hanging up her laundry in the backyard. And she was carrying a baby for a wealthy couple, and I thought that was very strange. All right, guys, there we have it. That was my conversation with Susan Strait all the way back in October of 2012, episode 117. Susan Strait's latest novel is called Mecca, published in 2022 on Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. You can find her on the internet at susanstrait.com. She is on social media. Uh, I believe Instagram is the place. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the Other People podcast on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. If you would like to get my weekly newsletter, it's free. Go over to Substack. Search for me by name, Brad Listy. I have a Substack now. That's where the newsletter lives. You can subscribe there. If you want to join the Other People Patreon community, you can do that at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. And if you want to do me a quick favor, please give this show a rating wherever you listen. Write a review if that's an option. It helps the show find new listeners. If you would like some apparel, an Other People t-shirt, sweatshirt, you can get that at the show's official website, otherppl.com. Scroll down, look for the t-shirt. You can't miss it. Finally, a quick plug for my latest novel. It's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. Available in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. I narrate the audiobook, so if you would like to read my novel, it's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. Okay, so on Sunday, I will be in conversation with C. Pam Zhang. Her new novel, Land of Milk and Honey, is available from Riverhead Books. 